at Langdon Hall in Cambridge, a beautiful space to be, Steve. So very nice to meet you and thank you so much for inviting me here today to enjoy this amazing exhibition. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks for the invitation. It's, oh, it's great. It, it, it's great. So we've had a little bit of a preview to uh, have a tour of your show and the meaning behind it, which is extremely powerful. And um, so I'm very, I feel very honored to be here with you this afternoon and have you share your story. Um, so let's dive in because this is all about Steve Fretwell. <laughs> great. Let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, so Steve, you've made quite a leap. From, uh, from sort of a Toronto corporate executive to being an artist in 2019. So how the heck did that happen? Yeah, I, uh, that's a really great question and I wish I had an exacting answer. <laughs> uh, there's two parts of it to, to uh, my thinking about that. Is I remember very distinctly the day that I first started painting. Beautiful Canada Day, all the yard work was done, there wasn't anybody around and I found myself surrounded by somebody else's artwork, and I thought, oh, okay, let's just get started. And so I did. And then in reflection, as I think back to what was motivating me to do that, I think a lot of professionals are in a situation in the corporate world where they lack this idea of creating something material. Um, so I think that's part of what motivated me to get started, and then I just kept on going. Perhaps it was just brute force. Well, you do have artistic leanings. I mean, let's face it, you've been an actor, you're a musician, uh, you're an artist. Um, you know, you have to feel the love before you can produce, <laughs> produce some great paintings, right? Well, I guess so, yeah. yeah so. Absolutely. So you've, t you've taken off your corporate hat very well, um, it would appear to me, and you've produced this incredible body of work. Um, and it's called um, A View From Above or Above? Just From Above. From Above, From Above. Um, so it's incredible. So um, I, I'm particularly interested in your love of military history. Um, it is extensive. And as I've done research on you, I've certainly uh, come to appreciate more about um, World War II and the various allies that participated in that. Um, but you certainly are a geek with all things military. So where did that happen to come from? Yeah, growing up in Ottawa, a lot of the, um, whether they were coaches or sports administrators or teachers or principals were retired military people. Hmm. We saw them around a lot and they were really active in things like the YMCA, the Boys and Girls Clubs, Scouts Canada, and I had a lot of respect for those people. And my interest in military history, I think is a reflection of just having that kind of exposure. Mm. Uh, so I read every book that I could and all of the movies and all the documentaries. And I think that cemented this foundation of appreciation for that particular um, generation of people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really awesome. Your explanation of your work, your impetus for your work, certainly is very much rooted in all of that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, Steve, let's start with this incredible book, uh, Finding Peace. Um, it's a gorgeous, gorgeous book. Um, I don't know how many pages. 216. 216. Uh, so, Finding Peace. Uh, is that a personal metaphor or is this something about uh, a different explanation for the word peace? Yeah. Well, there's two parts to it. Um, the first one in the military context is this idea that I, I came to the conclusion after years of thinking about this is that anybody who's involved in a serious conflict, to my view, had to make peace with themselves before they got involved in something. And when you listen to the documentaries and firsthand accounts, a lot of people make reference to this idea of rationalizing it in their mind. And I think that peaceful situations are obviously in stark contrast to conflict, but what drives humanity forward, to my view, is this desire of peace. Absolutely. Um, so this, this book is um, incredibly beautiful. You've certainly gone to great lengths to, uh, to produce something beautiful. This book will be available for sale while your show is at Langdon Hall, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, let's talk about the book for a minute and sort of the, the, the feel for the book. Um, what you've explained is that, hey, here's Steve the actor, 
<laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Shrinking violet that you are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so the very first image that you have in your book is, um, curiously, if I can go back and see it, because this book is heavy and well worth the money, I suspect. Help me find the first image. It's the next page. Next page? Okay. Just go to the next one. There you go. So here is the very first painting, uh, and it's called Paint by Numbers. And there's 50 portraits in here, in all in chronological order. So tell me about this uh, uh, initial painting here. You know, it looks fairly rudimentary. What, what was going on and who is it? Well, it's somebody from my imagination. Uh -huh. And as I explained in the opening sort of statement of the book is that when I started doing this, it occurred to me that in my life, repetition's always been my friend. Hmm. So I oh, thought, comfort. yeah, so I thought if I'm going to do something, I should give myself a fair chance. And I set a number of, I'm going to do 50 portraits. Wow. Always the same size, use the same materials, the subject matter would be the same. And I thought, you know, if I'm comparing my work to other people who have spent their whole lives doing this, I'd probably very, be very disappointed very early. <laughs> so, so by uh, my self-taught sort of brute force method, I just kept moving along and creating one character after the other after the other. And as I got through it, I began to really begin to appreciate the human factor that all these people that are, some of them are invented, some of them are actually real people, but they're people. And they all found themselves, you know, embroiled in this situation, some of them by choice and some of them by not so much choice, they were forced into it. And it really opened my eyes about things like a military wardrobe, it, um, the whole process around people becoming recruited into things and as they moved along. So it's 50 examples of, um, of work. And you made reference to it. I present them in the order that I produce them. Right. In fact, the entire book is pretty much every painting that I did from July 1st, 2019, the end of the book stops at July 1st, 2021. 2021. Right. So it's both an origin story, mm -hmm. how did this person get started, mm -hmm. and then a development of a particular style and a particular approach that as I got closer to the last six of the 24 months, my what I wanted to paint and how I wanted to express myself, I was much better at creating that, which landed me on the day before D-Day in the Kukenhoff series that are the primary pieces that Genesis are being shown here. here. Yeah. Right. I just wanted to show the very last uh, image in the series. It's called Fitz. Mm -hmm. uh, and what, what is this, the, your grand finale here? What's it, what's it all about? Yeah, I, you know, it, admittedly, I struggled near the end. I don't know, 46, 47, 48. And I came across this really well manicured, um, character from the Boer War. He was British and really refined and the photography at the time was somewhat rudimentary. Mm -hmm. You didn't get really Christmas, but you mm -hmm. a crispness. Mm -hmm. But you could tell from the wardrobe that a really great tailor was involved mm -hmm. in creating these uniforms, right? Mm -hmm. Because on on parade, all military uniforms are designed to say we're special mm -hmm. and take a look at us. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, all the other military efforts are designed to conceal. Right. It's all about camouflage, right? right? right. But not when they're on parade. They wear the big hats and mm -hmm. they have all the banners. Medals, the medals. Oh yeah, yeah, like 20 kilos of medals. <laughs> you think the book is heavy. <laughs> yes. Some of the people who I researched have just chests full of these things. Wow. And they all mean something, right? Wow. Uh, do you have a personal favorite in the book? Um, you know, I love them all. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Uh, but the one that was probably most meaningful to me appears on page 65. Okay. And that's an RAF uh, officer who um, was the, I was doing some research onto it and I shared, shared it with a friend of mine. And he uh, really latched onto the story. And then I ended up um, producing that painting and he insisted on buying it. Oh, great. And that painting now appears on the wall of that person. His name is Parsons. Uh, he was a, an RAF officer in World War II. It appears on the wall of his grandson's apartment in Boston, Massachusetts. Very nice. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's Mr. Nice. Uh, 
He's, he's actually, like most military people, they get nicknames. So as you can see from this. Snips. Yeah, because it's Parsons, right? So Parsnips. You know? Oh, that's clever, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. And this one is really meaningful to me because oh. it took me down a path of doing more research into the whole aviation uh, phenomena and the teams and the, all the pilots and the support crew and everybody around that, which is, as you can see, the development of the rest of my work. I'm really focused on that particular group of people. Absolutely. Well, it's really wonderful, Steve, and congratulations for producing it. I, uh, I think it will be a wonderful addition to your show here at Langdon Hall. Thank you. Right? Okay. Um, so, at what point did you decide to make the transition from portraiture to this very large postmodernist paintings that we see behind us? So, um, at what point did you say, okay, I'm kind of done with portraiture, I've been there, explored it, now I feel I want to move forward? There has to be some um, crux of, of impetus. So, what was that moment where the light came on and said, yeah, okay, I'm done with this, I've done my best. Now I'm gonna move on to the next thing. It actually happened halfway through. Hmm. When I was doing research on SNPs hmm. and trying to understand, you know, I found out through my through publicly available databases, I knew when he took off, when he landed, what kind of planes he flew in. He was actually shot down. I found out who shot him down, wow. where he was rescued in Holland, and he ended up as a prisoner of war. And I thought, Wow, I mean, that was a really amazing thing. Just to put aviation into context for you, in 1939 in Canada, there were 26,727 people who flew on an airplane. We had a population of six million at the time. Mm. So the idea of flying in a plane at the time was really very unique. To put that into present day context, in March of 2023, 6.8 million people in this country wow. flew on an airplane. Wow. So I thought it's a unique group of people. I like the idea that, that particularly, with the, with the exception of single seat aircraft, yep. it was a small, really tight team of people yep. that came from all walks of life. Yep. So as I focused on that particular group, I thought to myself, what does it feel like to look down at the world mm. from that perspective? Mm. First of all, it's unique. And then to look down at the world at a time when you know your life is at maximum risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, that's what led me to this idea of hope. Mm -hmm. It really cemented for me this concept that if you're going to do something like that, you have to have come to peace with yourself yeah. and you have to hope that your machine and your comrades and all the things of chance play in your favor, that you'll come home, mm -hmm. this thing will be over and you get to go back home. Mm -hmm. So that's where it started, this fascination mm -hmm. with it. And the first area that I focused on was the, um, the patterns that aviators took in trying to search for submarines in the North Atlantic. Mm -hmm. And that's what created this wow, idea of repeating, repeating pattern. They didn't just fly around hoping that they'd come across somebody. There was a science and methodology to the whole thing. Wow. Really fascinating stuff, right? Well, the whole subject of it, military conflict, is there's countless stories. I mean, each individual person, mm -hmm. there's 60 million people who mm -hmm. lost their lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's all an individual story. Right. And it, those stories represent both the best elements of humankind, and the worst. but of course the worst, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So this idea of this conflict and, and how do people get themselves into these kinds of situations really fascinated me and I liked the initial idea of looking down at the world and this unique perspective. So I thought, you know, can I somehow capture the emotion of that and do it in a structured, abstract way and apply it to landscape? I didn't know really all that would be, all the things that would be involved in that when I first got started, I kind of stumbled through it. Sure. And, but what's important is in the book, it shows every attempt that I made to try to come to something that I thought rang true to me and that would bring this emotion out of looking at something that people found interesting. I think that there's so much story attached to your painting, Steve, um, that I think it's really important for people to A, get the book and B, understand exactly you know, what's going on in your work. You know, when you first 
take a glance at them, you think, oh, they're nice abstract pieces, you know, they're very geometric. But, you know, there's such a powerful story behind it um, that I think you're gonna have uh, a challenge in telling your story as often as possible. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and the book helps to do that. And the book and certainly The helps. show here at Langman Hall has some posters and things that give, just helps to put it into, uh, put it into context. So the exhibition here is really focusing on two different uh, bodies of work. One is called Day Before D-Day, and the other is called the Kuchenhof Garden Series. So they're both displayed here in the hallway where we're sitting. There's several pieces in the dining room as well, and there is a couple of pieces as you enter the, uh, the, the foyer down there. Um, so I wanna start with the D-Day the, with the series. Um, and certainly taking an interest in your military history has, and I was particularly interested when I read about Frederick Law's experiments in aerial photography in 1912. Yes, yes you've and, done your homework. And I'm sure you were too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so what was that all about? What did he, what, what was he experimenting with? And how did these things leave such a lasting impression in your work? Good, uh, so I'll start at the beginning. Sure. Um, the idea of aerial reconnaissance was relatively a novel thing in the beginning mm. of World War I. The people who actually created the maps were artists. Mm. They would put their braids Sketches. Too. Sketches. They would put them right. up in a balloon and then, then they'd sketch it and right. pull them down as fast as they can and then go and make a mm. map. Mr. Law started taking photographs from balloons initially and mm. he realized that if you put a, apply a 60% overlap to the images and look at it through a stereoscope, it created a three-dimensional effect. So people were able then to understand how tall is that building, how high are those trees, is that hill, you know, a high hill or a low hill, all give a much better, much clearer understanding. So what happened then is they stood up individual units, and often they used Spitfires, at least in the, in the Commonwealth countries, Spitfires that were specially equipped with heated cameras and they could fly at higher altitudes and they were able to um, capture really important images. Mm -hmm. And recently museums around the world have begun to digitize these things. Ooh, so as soon as I started to look into it, I saw a massive data set. And the images contain who was the pilot, when was the picture taken, what time of day, wow. what's the location. Mm -hmm. So when I looked at them, I thought, oh, this is really an amazing way to look at the world. And those images often would show up in the press as, as they reported back home. And they say, you know, here's the outcome of our campaign against, you know, X city or whatever it was that they were, that they, mm. their targets were. So the idea of aerial reconnaissance and aerial photos became commonplace. You would pick up the, newspapers at the time and, wow. see, and see these pictures, right? Mm. So as I went through them, I realized that there's a massive amount of effort that went into photographing the Normandy coast mm. Mm. for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they photographed it, you know, almost every day for years leading up to the, um, invasion. the invasion and, and wow. liberation of Europe. Wow. So I had began to, to, in my book, I, you can see the experiments that I do. I go from doing just water in a series called Experiments in Blue. And then I transition over to this idea of how do I represent the beaches of Normandy? Mm. And because the source material was date specific, I could see some that were taken in winter, like this one, for example, right. there was snow all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Things in the fall, it looked different, but it gave you an idea of you know, what did the land look like? Was it used for farming? Where were the villages? Was the tide in or the tide out? Because they paid great attention to the tides. The tides. Sure. Um, so I, I started experimenting with that. And then over time, it occurred to me that instead of leaving everything as a macro, like looking up from mm -hmm. high down, yeah. Yeah. I inverted the concept and I began to create the sand when I want to show sand the grains of sand at the micro level. And in my head, each grain of sand along the, all those beaches and the code names of the beaches, of course, Canadian is mm -hmm. Juno mm -hmm. Beach, the Americans had Gold Beach and Sword Beach. Omaha. Sorry, Omaha and Utah, right. and then the Brits had Gold and mm -hmm. Sword Beach. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to represent the beach as 
a weave pattern of the people who were involved. So each grain of sand represents the story of an individual person. Wow, Here's an example beautiful? of, I mean, I hadn't quite figured it out wow. at this point. So beautiful. The idea of the beach, or obviously it's Gold Beach. Wow. Um, it was just one of the studies that I had. So I started experimenting with this at smaller scale. And then once I felt it resonated and ring true mm -hmm. with me, you I scaled it up to much bigger sizes. Right, right, right. And those bigger sizes are presented when you start to get, just give me a sec. Yes. So for example, yeah, this is a piece, um, it's a collector, I think in Toronto who owns this one. Um, it's 48 by 48. Oh, so beautiful. And that was the size that I thought had an emotional mm -hmm. impact. Definitely. Right? You can Definitely. connect the emotion with the structure and the story mm -hmm. in an abstract way. Mm -hmm. And um, people really connected to oh, this particular group. It's this is summertime. Yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. I must say, Steve, in listening to more of your story, um, it, it's, it, it's very deep and it's very, it's very personal. But it's also very introspective. You know, you are you are pulling things from deep within that obviously are resonating with you. And I think that that's a marvelous way to express. And and on top of that, your work is incredibly beautiful and pleasing, even for people, I guess, that don't know your story. Yeah, I I I've often asked myself, what is it about this particular subject matter that drew me into it? And and what I concluded over time was that. I really admired the values of that generation. Mm. Things like bravery, mm. commitment, um, country before self. Mm. Um, particularly in Bomber Crews, it was a team of eight people. Mm -hmm. So having a sports background, I understood what it's like mm -hmm. to work with a group, team, team and a group of people. So I was fascinated by that. And when I just started developing the pieces and people started collecting them, I began to listen to people's explanation about what is it about this that you like? And they explained to me the story to them was a launching point for an, uh, them understanding how their own values connect to the values of that generation. Wow. That's why people buy the stuff. Wow. And I've had people who have um, commissioned me hmm. to make a specific piece in honor of someone in their family wow. who served uh, in the service in this particular capacity of aviation and that's a really powerful oh, I'll thing say. for I'll people say. oh my gosh such a touchstone yeah and, and that being said you know some people when they look at the work they say to me i'm not really a great military history fan true but i know i don't want a tank true or a gun or a plane in my living room or my dining room. Some guy like, sold your life <laughs> on the beach, right? Yeah, that's, there's a category for that, but right. that's not me. Right. So the idea of creating something abstract that's rooted in a narrative, a story narrative, is really a launching point for people to think about that generation. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, not too far in the distant future, all of those people are going to be long gone if they're not now. Yeah, there's, I can't remember what the number is. Somebody right. knows what the number yeah. is of survivors. So uh, it, in a way, the work is a tribute mm -hmm. to that generation. That's mm -hmm. for me. Wow. But people connect with it because of the values of the generation mm -hmm. that they mm -hmm. admire. Interesting. I wouldn't have thought quite that way, but it's interesting that other people do. I had to do a lot of listening <laughs> <laughs> I to people awesome. before, I came, before I came to that conclusion. Uh, your source material, is it some inspiration from articles, uh, written articles? Um, what is your, how, what are you determining in, with your initial thought process? When I, it's a good question. So when I um, begin, the first place I start is the humanity. I know I'm doing something from above, and I try to imagine myself in the situation of that young person, mm -hmm. uh, often men and women who are in those, mm -hmm. in those circumstances. And I try to imagine, okay, what is going on with them? That's the emotional base. From that, whether it's a passage in a book, a clip in a movie, um, I drive my family crazy listening to all these documentaries and stuff. And it's like, hey kids, do you want to come watch uh, Hitler's invasion of Poland as seen by the BBC again? And they're like, no, dad, no. Yeah, no, no, no. I don't need to see that for I don't need to say that at the for the eighth time. So it's a collection of a whole bunch of things. So once I have the emotional anchor, 
I then try to say, okay, what's the structure? And I've got an idea of that. And then the color and what's the time of the season? Is it winter? Is it fall? Is, as I said earlier, is it is the tide in or the tide out? Like, what is it that I'm trying to represent particular to, uh, to that moment? Always keeping in mind this idea of what are the values of those people? And it, it just drives me to create multiple iterations along the same thing. Luckily, with seasonality, I can have winter versions and summer versions and spring. The spring versions have been really quite well received with people because the colors are so bold. Let's move on to the second body of work, which is here, and it's called the Kuchenhof Garden Series. So first of all, where is Kuchenhof Gardens? Kuchenhof Gardens is in uh, Holland, okay. and it originally started as a private garden, mm -hmm. but at the end of World War II, uh, the growers in the community got together and said, we need to restart this business. So they increased the scale significantly, pooled all their resources, and created this beautiful, it's both a show place for the trade. So if you want for, to buy for, flowers. For the tulip trade or for all flowers? Uh, mostly tulips, tulips right. and that. Bald flowers tends to be right. the focus of their right. work. So I was tracking um, the Canadian campaign after we landed on Juneau Beach, what happened to the Canadians next? And I came across this idea of our liberation of Holland. I had visited Holland about 10 years ago, and mm -hmm. you show up and you say you're Canadian, and the smiles are really meaningful and, and, mm -hmm. and significant. So, Kuganoff Gardens had that sort of historical appeal, but it also appealed to me on another level because I grew up in Ottawa. Mm. And all these tulips were the tulip festival. It's an echo right. of our special yes. relationship with Holland yes. and it continues to this day. Yes. I can't remember, is it 10,000 or 20,000 bulbs we get every year yes. from the Dutch government yes. and, and appreciation for what our, our, our team had done over there. Mm -hmm. So, I like the idea, but all the source material was black and white. So as soon as I looked at it, I saw a geometry that was interesting. Then I thought, well, this looks like Ottawa. And then I thought, wow, the colors, like the Dutch farmers, there's no color they won't use. And it is really very, very strong. So I imagined in my mind, if I were a person flying and I was able to fly over Kuchenhof Gardens, the contrast of that beauty and what it represented, hope, rebirth, revitalization of, a, of, the, of the continent. I know if I was flying a plane, I'd want to fly over that any chance that I had because it, it's not bombed out and it's not burnt and it's not gray. Right. So that's why I was attracted to Kuchenhof Gardens, geometry, color, and a really strong Canadian focused um, story of us liberating that country. And the fact that there was beautiful color amongst all the tragic, burnt out, gray, horrible, horrifying images. So these young men that were flying in planes and had flown in planes throughout the war and now had this opportunity to see these magnificent fields of color. Right. Yeah, right. that's exactly what right. that's exactly what drew me to that. I felt mm -hmm. it was a really strong emotional anchor. Mm -hmm. And when you hear them in documentaries talk about the Canadian aviators role in that. Their faces just light up when they talk about Holland and they talk about the, the view from above and how it was in such amazing contrast to what they had seen as you, as you just said. You, you did mention that um, the uh, pilots were able to fly at a much lower altitude at some point so that they could actually see more clearly the beautiful images. Right, near the, end of, near the end of World War II, um, Allied forces had complete and total control of the air. So they didn't need to fly over Holland at 20,000 feet anymore. They didn't need to work their way up and then go across the channel. They could fly in at five, six, seven thousand 7,000 feet. So the, so the young men who looked out the window got to see something up close that they normally didn't get the chance to see. And these guys are young, right? They're what, 17, 18, 19, 20 year olds? Some of them didn't quite finish high school. Wow. A lot of them were first year universities. They mm -hmm. went to Western, they mm -hmm. went to Queens, they went to U of T. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, Canada was not only the supplier of equipment, but a massive supplier of training of Commonwealth Air Forces from you know, every country you could imagine. There wasn't a day that you would be going around Ontario between 1939 and 1945 where you didn't look up and see 
planes flying around and people learning how to do all of this stuff because it took a lot of time to treat to train, train them, them right it's a, mm -hmm. it's a significant mm -hmm. amount of, amount of effort on that interesting uh, your paintings are very large in scale um, so I was quite interested to learn process technique uh, so first of all the tools that you are using Steve are sort of out of the ordinary let's just say um, you're using different uh, methods and and instruments so what kinds of instruments are you using to create some of these, these things? it's, it's the, the tools of the mason trowels uh, that I use I'm trying to get a particular geometry and that it's repeatable so I use a particular size trowel the interesting thing about not only the instruments themselves, but my use of acrylic paint is that I can apply a lot of pressure to acrylic. Right. And when you pressure, put a lot of pressure, you end up with colors blending together in ways that you wouldn't right. normally expect. You can't right. apply right. with a with a brush right. or even with a um, with a palette knife because you can't apply enough pressure. So those are the instruments that I use. And um, it took, what it, my process is I start with a sliver of an idea. I just get this idea in my head, okay, what did that possibly look like? And I make it at a small scale. And then I gradually make it bigger and bigger and bigger until I land on something that resonates with me. Mm. Once I have that, I then take that component. So on the day before D-Day, Juno Beach, for example, it's the water. What does water look like in the winter? Is there snow over it? Is it frozen? How's it working? Um, I add that component to the beach component to the land components and cobble them together. The other thing is as I scale the work up, I stop at the point where I'm thinking, okay, this is meaningful and powerful enough for me that you shouldn't be able to, I hope, people should walk by it and stop for a moment. Oh, sure. And at 36 by, even anything less than 36 by 36, tend not, tends not to have that kind of impact, impact that 100%. I'm trying for. Yeah. 100%. And the limitation on scale, I do have some work here that's 60 by 80. Yeah. It gets bigger, so if somebody has a space and they really want to make an impact, they, uh, they, they're attracted to those pieces. Absolutely, because your palette is very luxurious. It's very rich. Um, I know that you paint in acrylic for a reason. Um, it would be interesting. Have you tried any in oil? I do have some in oil. <laughs> the, the, the challenge with the oil is when you apply it that thick, it takes six, eight months <laughs> sometimes a year yeah. for it to dry, right? So I've had some people who bought oils from me and I say, okay, put it on the wall, but please don't fall into it or touch it or anything because it... Maybe I can get some sort of a drying agent or something that can help as we go along, but the, I'll figure that out. But all of this work that's presented here is is acrylic. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. There's gilt, uh, gold gilt also incorporated into the work. Um, for what reason? Yeah, I mean, gold is a, is a mineral. It's I think it's the mineral that's most easily recognized by people in every corner of the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, gold won't rust. It doesn't decay over time fire doesn't destroy it, it's virtually indestructible, and to my view, it is eternal. Mm -hmm. So, in this idea of paying tribute to that generation, I try to insert gold in, in with this idea that we should never forget what those, uh, what those people did to give us um, the freedom that we enjoy today. So, so beautiful. Um... So both of the series that are presented here and your show will, will open on um, April the 21st. Your, your opening is April 21st and it will run until... The end of August. Something like that. Um, so besides the incredibly gorgeous um, color in your images, and I know that you touched on this, um, what else do people connect with? Besides this very interesting thought about uh, people can then think about the values that that segment of our, our society held. Um, it, I, I can. My father happened to be, you know, it fought in World War II, as did many. Mm -hmm. um, is there something else that people are drawn to in your work? Uh, I think the common theme is this notion of values. Mm -hmm. Some of them, some people look at it and say, they've been candid with me, and they say, see, I could care less about the story behind it. Oh. I love the geometry. Uh, I like it. Mm -hmm. uh, it means something to me. 
Um, I mean, the, the reality with any kind of abstract work is you have to be able to look at it and lose yourself in it and want to see it. And sometimes people who, who collect my work they're not great at articulating why they like True. something. And that's okay with me. That's okay. Right? That's fine. Sure. Often they'll pivot, as you just did, mm -hmm. they'll pivot to talking about someone in their family yes. or someone in their background rather than talking about the work. But the work is the launching point mm -hmm. for conversations. And it's my hope that in the longer term, when people put something like this in their home or their office or their cottage, that it will, if they know the story, that it will trigger a conversation about the values that those people had, the things that they did, and the lessons that can be learned from that. And if I can achieve that through abstract, structural abstract landscape and it encourages these conversations, then I think that's a, that's a real win for me and a real win for people who got it in their, in their family. You've done your job, right? You've done your job for commentary for future generations to remember. I hope so. Right. I hope so. And I, I, I think that that's the challenge that we all face is how do we keep that memory alive of those folks? Mm -hmm. And you know, like I described earlier, I grew up in high school around these people, right? I saw them, they were in their 60s. But my kids didn't, they maybe saw one or two at Remembrance Day, but they didn't have the same kind of Emotional ever present. Yeah, the sure. attachment is, is a little bit different. So to the extent that I can create something and bring it forward that assists people in telling stories about grandma and grandpa and other people who are in their family, then I, I think that that helps to keep the memory alive. Very poignant. Well, Steve, congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. An extremely interesting body of work. I do hope that people can come to Langdon Hall and see the show. And above and beyond that, I hope that people can contact you uh, to learn more about what you're doing and to perhaps consider purchasing a piece of art from you in the future. Yes, that would be great. I think I have all the social media stuff like stevefarrellart.com. I have an Instagram page. Langdon Hall does a great job of displaying the works that are available here. Um, and interestingly, um, for people, if you see something here, but it's not the right size or the right scale, as I mentioned, a lot of people come with a specific size in mind and they say, can you make me a Juno Beach that's the summer, but it's gonna fit in my dining room or my front room or the hallway or something, something else in their place. So those are available as well. Awesome. So mention again your, your website address, please. It's stevefretwellart.com, right. just like it sounds. Mm -hmm. And then the Instagram page is stevefretwellart. Okay. Uh, the book is available through Langton Hall. And then just today, I finally figured out how to sell it on Amazon. It wasn't easy. So it's also available for sale at amazon.ca, just Steve Fretwell Art, and it'll come up. Beautiful, beautiful coffee table book. I'm sure it would be a wonderful addition to uh, to many homes, right? So thank you very much, Steve. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you.